You're watching Sky Sports. Presenting the fighting pride of Newbridge, Wales, Joe Welcome to our latest ringside special with a fighter many believe to be one of the best Brits to ever lace up the gloves. We've brought you up close to both Chris Eubank and Nigel Benn. Now time for another of the striking super middleweights. He was a three-weight ABA champion, a long-reigning world professional king with one of the greatest records of all time. A perfect 46-0, and 0, Joe Calzaghi, CBE. Delighted to see you. Good to be here, Adam. You okay? <laughs> Yeah, how's, okay. how's life teaching, treating you, Joe? It's good. It's not as exciting, obviously, than when we used to fight, but yeah, it's good. It's good. Do you, do you still do you still keep keep fit? Do you still visit the gym, or are you just thinking, you know what, I'm at it now, forget it, it's yeah. a past life? Obviously, try and keep in shape, you know, at the end of the day, it's in the blood, isn't it? Mm. So, we box boxing since age of 9, 10, so when you retire, you got to keep in shape, you know, and I uh, don't do much boxing, to be honest, and uh, I made a conscious effort after I retired not to, not to go in the gym. Why? Because, I suppose, 27 years fighting, plus my hands were knackered as well, that's another reason. Mm. But just not get tempted into coming back. I made, the, I made the decision way before the Roy Jones fight, I was going to retire. Like, to me, you know, I achieved everything I wanted to achieve. Like, after I beat Mikko Kessler, the frustrations of being a WBO champion all them years, and uh, fighting former world champions just after they lost their belt, you know, it was difficult to keep motivated and just be one of the champions. So. Like I said, you know, to, to unify all the belts and become Ring Magazine champion in Millennium Stadium, you know, in front of 50,000, to me, you know, that was everything. And the only thing that was left for me was to, to move up away and uh, go to the States. And I did that. And before the, um, before the Roy Jones fight, I knew I was going to retire. And, um, you know, I had fun in Madison Square Garden. You know, I wanted to fight the, the Mecca boxing and to fight one of the all time greats. It was fantastic, and I feel blessed I was able to uh, finish off my career the way I did. You say life is not quite as exciting now. What do you really miss about, about the sport? What do I miss is everything. It's where I am. You know, it's, that's what I knew from age of 10. You know, to, be, to be a champion, that's what I miss. You know, to fight in front of the big crowd and the buzz, the adrenaline and euphoria is just you know, amazing, just being a, being a champion. Were you nervous ever going out, or was that adrenaline just sort of stored in? You mean in the fight? Yeah, beforehand, when you were sort of going out, were, were there nerves? Or... It's, it's mad, it, like, the, there would be nerves, but the day of the fight, I'd just be in the zone, and it'd be adrenaline, you know, and I'd just be complete focused. When I get to the arena, I'd have my music, and my, nobody could speak to me, I'd just be completely in the zone, and, um, it was controlled. It was controlled. Was that the great feeling then, knowing you were you were going in, into battle to execute your skills? You know, you, yeah. you're always so confident in your talent and ability, weren't you? Yeah, just that's, that's my way of entertaining, and that, and that was it. I just loved it, and you know, just I was always 100 percent confident. I always had faith, and just believed in myself, believed in my destiny, and yeah, every time I used to the training camp was hard bit. Boxing to me was the fight was the easy bit. That was the entertaining. That's just to go to put on a show. And, uh, and, and to fight and please the crowd and to win. But the build-up beforehand, you know, losing, like I said, two stone, more than two stone each fight, that was the hard bit. And I've put my dad as well for, for two months training <laughs> camp. <laughs> so, who's I done it? I'm joking, I love you, man. But yeah, we had some right, some right banter in the gym, and it was great. So <laughs> trust me, after them, they'd run up their mountains in Wales and spend two months in that gym, the fight's the easy bit. That was, that was a good bit. Let's start at the beginning then. From 1995 to, through to 1993, bar 90, well, 1989, you won an amateur title every year. At what stage 
did you realise, you know what, I'm something special here? Because in amateur, um, you were outstanding too. Yeah, well, I lost my first ever amateur fight. Mm. I lost my first fight. Remember every single loss. I think I lost nine amateur fights, mm. 120 fights. I remember every loss. And I remember how much it hurt me and how, how much pain it gave me, the failure and losing. And every time I, every time I lost, I'd cry. And, you know, I'd, I'd be so upset for, like, weeks and weeks. And I hate that feeling. And it made me more determined. I remember boxing a, a fighter called Chris Stark. Yeah. And his, his dad was also one of the judges, right? So <laughs> I, I could say I did get robbed. <laughs> I probably made a case I got robbed every fight. But, you know, um, yeah, I lost the first fight. My old trainer, Paul Williams, had to come and take me out of the, of the ring. I was on my hands crying like this. I beat him like six times afterwards. And so it wasn't that, um, it wasn't that, it wasn't like it was open class from the start. I lost my first, I think I lost my fifth fight. That's pretty ragged and wild. Um, it was 1985, 70 ballrooms in Derby, winning my first ABA title, you know, uh, I think it's Ian Raby, his name was, and I won in the first round. And mm -hmm. that, winning that first ever title, British title, was like amazing. And even above all my title fights, is one of the proudest and happiest I ever was. And I still remember that feeling being a 12 year old, 13 year old, 36 kilograms, I think it was five stone 10. And it was, it was great. And that was when my dream started. That's when I thought, you know, I love this. I want to be a world champion one day. And you said you laced them up at sort of nine, mm. 10. Do you think you were born to box, Joe? I, I thought I was born to be a footballer, to be honest. Um, that being Sardinian, Italian, um, I want to play football. So that, I used to play in the 10s. And um, you know what, you give me a punch ball. Uh, I think I was nine, and he saw me punching this punch ball, and he was teaching me the basics. And obviously, he saw a talent at the time. You know, took me to the local boxing gym when I was nine. But when he was, my dad was a musician, so when he was away singing, I used to go and skip the boxing training and go play football. You know, so yeah, I wanted to be a footballer to be honest at the start. And I just remember winning my first ABA title, then be on a subs bench in the freezing cold. And I thought, realizing, listen, you know. Boxing is what you're going to be good at, not football. So I quit the football and uh, stuck to boxing. Your dad's been such a, a character all the way through. Take me back to, to those sort of early days. And, you know, he was a, a musician. He'd arrived. He had that sort of eclectic background. And, mm. and then he was training you into becoming a, a champion. I mean, it's a, it's a very strange story, isn't it? Yeah, it's, uh, it's a great story. You know, um, yeah, my dad, he, he could box himself a bit, you know. He learned when he was younger from my grandfather. He used to do a bit of boxing. And, um, yeah, he just taught me the basics. I used to spar with him. I remember coming home and he'd get the cushion from the, the set. He'd just open and start punching that, sparring. And they used to punch, punch the walls with boxing gloves on and stuff. It was just, yeah, it was, it was amazing. Took me, luckily, they had a, an amateur boxing club, Newbridge ABC, that was about two miles from my house. So I used to walk to the gym, walk back home. And so I was very lucky that we had a, that place I could train and box Mondays, Wednesdays and Fridays. But every other day I, I would train with Dad. And he, he'd send me on my runs, he'd give me exercises to do. So to be honest, I trained like a pro from a young age. And um, I remember not turning up for most of my exams. Didn't like school much. And I remember one of my career's teachers said, oh, so Joe, now what job would you want to do when you leave school? I said, I'm going to be a world champion. She laughed. No, really, no, what job do you want? I said, I'm going to be a world champion, <laughs> seriously. And uh, that was my goal, you know, that was my aim. I honestly believed that because would be a world champion. Because you were a freeway to ABA I was, champion. Yeah, I was a you champion from the, the age of 13. Pedigree. Yeah, I was a champion from the age of 13, and I just believed in myself. You know, and I used to spar with pros at a young age. Even before I turned pro, I, I, I sparred with professionals who were quite good, but very good, like I sparred with Nicky Piper. Yeah. And, um, you know, he just boxed Nigel Benn, and I was, I was in control. I was an ABA champion, so I, I really believed in myself. You know, and it, and it proved that when I turned pro, fighters like your mate, Mr. Stinger Mason, that normally gives a few rounds to opponents, I was, I was knocking out pretty quick. So early start of my career, I was knocking everybody out pretty, pretty first couple of rounds. I remember hearing about you as the amateur, in the amateurs, and then when you were to fight my, my friend Paul Mason in your second fight, we thought this would be easy. He slaps this kid, isn't all that. One round later, the fight's over. <laughs> you, you've done him. But that's his claim to fame now. He said, yeah, I'll yeah, show right. like you. <laughs> did, did that... Did that did that bother you at, at any stage in your career when people said he just slaps, he, he doesn't no, but listen, hit to, hard? Do you know what? You watch my career, right? Basically, throughout my career, I changed my style. Like, I was a big, big puncher. I used to load up the left hand. That's why so many knockout wins. You watch my early fights, I used to load up the left hand. And, and I always had fragile lands for age of 14, 15. And um, I had to change my style. Mm -hmm. So I started punching in bunches more. 
start, stop loading up on the, with the left hand because I knew as soon as they connect on the head, my hand's going to go. So I started throwing all fast combinations. So the hands were a worry right from the beginning? Oh, yeah, but bad, yeah, since I was 13, 14, my left hand's always been in trouble. I had to deal with that right, right from my career. And I, had, I had injections between before every fight, nearly, because just to kill the pain. I do remember benefiting from every time you fought, because every time you advertised that Joe Kazak was fighting, I'd start training because I thought, his hands are gonna, <laughs> his hands are gonna let him down, and that usually yeah. happened quite it's a few times. Shoot, I think when nickname was sick note at the time. You yeah, know? that's so, right. Uh, I should have took a percentage off. Keep fit, because Joe might follow this fight. Or not? Of course, it bothered me because you know what? If I'm not fighting, I'm not getting paid. You know, I, I had a family at a young age. My my kids were just growing up. I'd pay the mortgage, so. But did the know. criticism, the sick note thing, bother you? Um, that... Yeah, well, of course. You know, I think people didn't understand that I was the one that that, that was you know suffering. Mm. So I'm not fighting, I'm not getting money, not getting paid. And it was one of them things, but I was never going to go into a fight unless I was 100% fact. Because, you know, you only got yourself to blame. You know, if you go, like, 50% into a fight and your hand's gone, that's it. There were super middleweights in the country at the time that were hitting the headlines. At that time, did you look up to them and thought, these aren't all that, I'll pass, pass through these guys? Do you know what? I used to love watching, you know, Chris Eubank, Ben Collins, Watson. It was inspiration to me. And um, I think I was AB champion. I knew I was going to become a super middleweight, so I knew that was going to be my weight division, you know? And it was just fantastic. I just loved watching them. I've I got to be honest, I'm a big fan of all of them, but I'm a Eubank fan as well. I loved the way he carried himself. Who did you think was the best of that lot? It's, that's difficult. That's difficult to say, because they all beat each other, didn't they? You know? Um, it's hard. It's hard. They all had a great strengths, you know? Eubank, Ben, massive puncher. Collins was more of a slugger. And Watson, you know, was... Was, was a great fighter too, so... And you about the entertainer as well. Yeah, entertainer. I used to watch them fight, you know, and uh, to, to fight him was, uh, was, was a dream. You're very, very confident, aren't you, that tomorrow you'll be a world champion? Yeah, but I'm definitely going to be world champion tomorrow inside the distance. Definitely. OK, Joe, many thanks. Good luck. Well. <laughs> <laughs> That's for the camera. <laughs> Is it my turn or are you right? Yeah. You're gonna get knocked out it's... too by. Oh well, oh, I mean, man. listen, we'll see what happens, yeah? yeah man. Fight number 50 for Chris Eubank. But is this a comeback born of desperation for money and a craving for limelight? Or has Eubank rediscovered a genuine desire to restate his credentials? And what about Calzaghi? <laughs> Untried. And let's go with the left hand straight away. Eubank may... I didn't know whether he might just try to catch Kalzaghi cold. Well, Kalzaghi is a very fast starter. Ten first round. Oh, the left goes. hand puts you back on the floor for only the fifth time in his career. What a start by Kalzaghi. He means business, all right, this Welshman. And a good right hand there. Kalzaghi's even moving through the shuffles now. He's loving the big stage. Kalzaghi landed a good left hand there. It's a good exchange from him. Look at Eubank come back at him, letting go with right hands. Had to give ground again. He just cannot put out Kalzaghi's fire, though. Well, if Eubank's going to go out with this fight, if this will be his finale, He'll go out in style and put up a tremendous battle. Well, he may not go out after this. He can walk out of this ring with his head held high. Whether he would want to fight on. This has been a, another aging fight, really. But Kalzaghi has answered the questions here. All of them in the affirmative. Kalzaghi just stung by one right hand. You felt there right towards the end. Holds on, there's the final bell. They embrace at the bell, the fusion of spirits. Kalsagi is lifted aloft. I think we all know which way the judges will see that. Dave Powers scores the bell, 118 to 109. Paul Thomas scores it, 116 to 111. And Roy Francis scores it, 118 to 111. For the winner who is now WBO Super Middleweight Champion of the World. Were you intimidated 
whatsoever in the build up to that because mm -hmm. you was the, the youngster coming through the, the cheeky cheeky yeah. chap expecting to take over the big guns was, did it bother you the build up well, to yeah of course it did a bit i was i was so nervous right i normally weigh 12 10 going into the fight you know mm. i know no, no, my body 12 stone on a day i rehydrate i'd be like between probably 12 9 12 10. yeah but that fight i was 12 stone four I was I was very nervous, and it wasn't about you know everything that I worked for all my life was on that one night, and it just wasn't about winning the world title. It was it was financially I had to win that. My, my boy was just born, I had to pay the mortgage. If I win this fight, I can buy a nice house for my family. If I don't, you go back to drawing board. Big pressure. Massive, massive, massive pressure. Massive pressure. Huge pressure. And uh, like I said, you know, um, I was pretty nervous going into that fight. No matter what, I'm proud of you, but you have to fight this fight. You have to fight this fight, Joe. And so when did you first realise that you had a boxer on your hands in Joe here? When I was about I say, eight years old, every kid's got sports, you know, and Joe was playing a bit of soccer with his uh, local school. And one particular Christmas I bought him a speedball. Are you with me? Don't it shows something, well, it looks a bit, something special there, like, you know? This I'll tell you, brother. You can't have one without the other. You can't have one. And you love each other, really, don't of you? Course, of course, I love my son. I, for me, I always put it son first, definitely um, boxers second. There's no way I reverse that, though. That's all this one. It's cool. Nope. <laughs> Joe, did you feel it was a bit like you and your dad against the world? I mean, you're down in, in the valley, sort of out of the way, and, and no one's really taking notice that, that you have to do this between the two of you mm. and somehow get through the boxing politics and the long road ahead because it is tough for fighters. Yeah, you know, listen, we come from an unfashionable club where we was in South Wales and uh, father never boxed, a musician. People say, listen, it's not going to work, you know, it's not going to work. You need to get proper training, you need to get a professional trainer. But I knew that my dad was the best trainer for me and he went and proved it and he proved his worth by training three world champions, you know, which was fantastic. So, yeah, I, we did feel the underdog, but I suited that. It suited me. And a lot, of, a lot of fighters don't stay with their fathers throughout their careers in the corner, but you did. You managed it. You didn't have to go off and find, and find some sort of, you know, fashionable <laughs> trainer around the world. You guys just had some sort of chemistry that got you through all the wins. If it's, if it's not broken, don't try and fix it at the end of the day. We had some ups and downs, but, I mean, you know what? You come to my place in, in Wales, and that is a training camp. People say, don't you go to training camp? Well, you stay at home. I was comfortable around my family. I could be left alone on the hills and the runs and the mountains. The only thing was I had to get in with sparring partners, but I was at peace there. I could stay away from it, from everything, and just concentrate on what I was, what I was doing. So you was never tempted to, to, to go abroad, because I'm quite sure you lot had a lot of people whispering no, in you, go to America or get to London or something like that. You was never well, tempted. Well, basically, yeah, I, I did that once. Um, what happened, I, I, when I beat Chris Eubank, I literally didn't spar for two years with an elbow injury. So I was boxing against the likes of David Starry, Robin Reed, and um, who else was it? Uh, the first couple of defences. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't, I couldn't oh, spar, yeah, 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 I couldn't spar. So I was just hitting the bag. And uh, I remember going to Chesson, I think, in, uh, in Hartford, yeah. right, for I think two weeks before the Omar, Omar Sheikah fight. Yeah. You know, Omar Sheikah was, a, at the time, was a dangerous, Very dangerous. contender. He, he'd just been Glenn Johnson, mm -hmm. who was obviously Glenn Johnson, who was, a, who was a good fighter. He beat him a final eliminator. And he came with a talking big thing, a reputation of being a big puncher. And um, I thought, listen, I, I need to start sparring, you know. So I went to uh, Hartford, and I was dreadful, to be honest, to start the first few days of sparring. My timing was completely out, you know, from punching the bags and not sparring for so long. But after, in the second week, I felt myself coming back, you know. I felt like me again. The confidence was coming back. I was, my timing was good. I felt. 100%, and I knew this guy was dangerous. He got into my skin, which is the worst thing he could have done. So it really wound me up. So, how, uh, how did I, you do it? How did you do it? No, I was just talking, you know, talking a lot of um, trash. And uh, I like to keep talking. That just motivated me to want to do some damage in me. I remember the night well at the yeah. Wembley Conference mm -hmm. Centre, and then afterwards, you rolling around on the floor with your dad. I mean, you know it meant what? a lot it's, that fight, it didn't was, it? It was, it was fantastic. I went on my knees with my dad, because I, I, <laughs> I went through so much through the... Um, what people don't know about, I'm talking about now. 
through my injuries, you know, through frustrations, through inactivity, and, you know, to do, to fight and finally get myself back, fighting like I knew I could fight, and stopping in the five rounds was, was brilliant. It was relief as well. But life wasn't that easy because the fight after that, you had to fight your friend, Richie Woodall. Yeah, that's, that's strange, you know what? Because I respect, I really like Richie and his dad, Len, and we you know, obviously get on well with my dad as well. And I found it very hard to motivate myself. I knew Richie would be a dangerous fight, but I found it very difficult because, you know, we did do the head-to-head. -head. I was, like, looking for uh, an advantage when it comes to the psyche and, and the the mind. I'm always pretty good at, you know, mind games. But we didn't use that. And uh, I was in two minds when, when I was offered the fight with Richie. He just lost the WBC title. And I was thinking, I don't want to fight my friend, but on the second part, I should have given an opportunity, you know? You've got to get a good payday and an opportunity to fight. And, you know, Richie fought a great fight. It was a tough one. It was a tough fight. Because some people were, were, were saying your opponents weren't really up to it, but then you talk about people like Richie Woodle and David Starry. Mm. Not a great fight, but a good opponent. And then Mario fight when you took him on in Cardiff and he came with, with this sort of reputation from Germany and, and he didn't even last a round. I mean, were you annoyed that the, the critics were out there still snapping away and saying, Joe's not fighting anybody? You were, weren't you? Well, of course, you know, at the end of the day, uh... So you can't win, you know, sometimes, unless you unify the titles or anything else, people don't know who the opponent is. Like Mario Veig, I was 29-0, I think, at the time. Because I beat him in the first round, you must, be, you must be crap. I never heard of him. But, unfortunately, that's the way it was, and yeah, I was frustrated. Uh, of course I was frustrated, because I wanted, I wanted to prove I was the best champion in the world. And you probably wanted forwards. Roy Jones and James Tony and that lot at that time, but it's the politics again. You can't always have these fights when yeah, you it want was. Them. And the Hopkins fight, we, we looked for that one as well, when he was middleweight champion. Yeah, but so you, politics, you, you did want the fight, so you were aware of them thinking these fights might happen yeah. eventually. Yeah. I always wanted the unification fights. I always asked for the fights. They all got the money, they wanted too much money, and then obviously, listen, it's a business, isn't it? And that's the way it is. So you had to make do with what was in front of you, Charles Brewer, 2002. He was, uh, I didn't realise he, he was a natural lefty, right? Because mm. he's left handed, I didn't know that. So I thought I'd stay away from his right hand, the southpaw, until he hit with a body shot in the first round. I would hope. <laughs> so all of a sudden, my I was going to box it from distance, but it went toe to toe. So he caught me with a good shot. So I crouched in and just went toe to toe with that guy for for, for twelve rounds. I think it was one, one a great fight, you know. It was a great fight. You liked fighting the Americans, didn't you, Byron Mitchell? You were down for the first time. You got up and wiped him in two. Omar Sheikha, of course, and and then and then Brewer. I mean, they, were, they were tough guys. They were tough guys. I always seem to motivate myself and, and, and raise my game when they fight the Americans for some reason. But, um, yeah, Byron Mitchell, you know, big puncher. Uh, and that's one of my proudest, proudest wins because it's the first time in my life i ever been on the floor. I remember the first round, I just completely bashed him up, you know what I mean? Yeah, just like, box well, dad gave me a kiss and went back to the seat. He never did that again. I thought, don't ever do that again. Because <laughs> the next round, I got back, was on my ass. So, um, yeah, all of a sudden, I get caught with a punch, go down. I remember getting back up. You know what, why am so proud? Because it shows what's inside he was a fighter because you can't really prepare yourself how you're going to react when you go on the floor. Never been down in sparring at never all? Sparring, I know you weren't an amateur. Never, never sparring. ever sparring, nothing. Never been down. So what was it like? And it was my 13th defence as well. So, so what was it like? What was that feeling when you... You don't really know much about it until the referee's going four, five. <laughs> you got like three seconds of what are you going to do? And the guy who's come to charge it, you guys just toe to toe. -to -toe. <laughs> And they dropped him with the left hand, thank God, just afterwards, and stopped him the same you round. You actually won the same round, didn't you? You, you yes, won the round. Yes, he came in trying to finish me, and I, I just stood took the toe wing in the way, and I caught with the left and the chin. And, you thought, and then I just, just steamrolled <laughs> him and just like throw as many punches as I possibly could to get him out of there. But, <laughs> wow. And, mo tricks. and most fighters, when they get hit on the chin and they're being put down, in the back of their head, they think, am I, am I chinny, am I losing it a little bit? Did you doubt yourself at all? No. <clears throat> no, I didn't. Listen, I was always... Uh, I've always been attacking, attacking so powerful, a lot of punches. I would never want to change my style and have self-doubt. Mm -hmm. Listen, if you get caught with the, with the right shot, you'll go down wherever you are. They brought Jeff Lacey over. I mean, he had all the, the, the superstar treatment over there. Everyone thought he was the next best thing uh, and all of that. And, of course, that, that turned out into probably your most perfect night of all. I mean, he didn't get near you. Was that satisfying beyond belief, that? Yes, um, I think that's probably one of my proudest, if not proudest, wins because it was a situation going into the fight. You know, I was the underdog. I was getting written off by a lot of people, being too old, and this guy was coming with an amazing reputation, you know, Olympic medalist, knocking everybody out. And then... He was a mini Mike with the Tyson. Shape, with the shape on him as well. Mm. 
And um, yeah, you know, I nearly pulled out the fight. So I thanked my dad for that because I, the week before I was going to pull out the fight because I injured my wrist. I went to Harley Street, they gave me an injection, said, Joe, you need to rest your hand for three weeks. Went on the phone. I'm going to say exactly what language, can't use a language. A lot of <laughs> so he's, like, he's like, what do you mean? You can't pull out this fight. You can't pull out this fight. You know, I said, well, Dad, I can't fight. He said, listen, if you don't fight this guy, it's, not, it's never come back. You have to fight this guy. You want when the hands on you go and fight this guy. And, you know, I started to doubt myself a little bit. And I think, well, I can't fight this guy with one hand. I went to the gym. I said, Joe, I said, no matter what, I'm proud of you, but you have to fight this fight. You have to fight this fight, Joe. He said, trust me, this is going to make you this fight. And I think, Dad, I can't fight this guy. Why are we talking about this? Like, this is going to be the easiest fight. This guy's going to make you. And I said, how do you make that out? And he said something quite simple. He said, listen, this guy moves five times and throws one punch. You throw five punches and move once. So think about it. She made the point. So every time he tried to set his feet, I was throwing combination of flurries and just annihilated the guy. So, you know, I think um, to so be written off by the Americans and your own people in Britain, because I was, like I said, the bookies had me, the underdog, which is the only time in my, ever in my career I was the underdog. Was that the only time? Only time. Like, Pete Manico was a slight favourite. Mm. Hopkins, slight favourite. Mm. Uh, but Kessler was a slight favourite. But the rest one. of them, yeah, I was the underdog. He came up with a massive entourage. You know when all the American TV <laughs> people, are, executives are coming over with him, he's brought a big fan base with him as well. So. He just brought your dad. Yeah, it was me. And <laughs> the old man. And the guy from the he's always just saying, he said, Joe, Where's your, where's your guys, man? I went, this is it. <laughs> Me and my guy there, man. <laughs> That's it. But, yeah, it was... Um, oh, listen, you know what? It's just a beautiful night, the way it went. It's just perfect, that, the way that, it went. That fight, would you say it got you the, the, the respect all around the world? Oh, 100%. 100%. They had to take notice of me. I had to take notice, especially, in, you know, uh, in America, you know, because, you know, they believe you have to go to America to prove something. But they sent this guy over. I think he was going to beat me. <clears throat> And to win the way that won was, uh, was, was great, and I think it really... And to be IBF champion as well as Deli Bio, yeah. finally unify the title yeah. after uh, nine years, mm. frustrating years, was, um, was fantastic. But then, obviously, we had Mikko Kessler, who had the other two belts. So that was the next aim after that. And of, course, of course, special, wasn't it, in Wales, that being the Millennium Stadium and, and, and the huge audience that were there for Kester. And as you said, Kester unbeaten. And that was, must have been a game like the Lacey fight. Very special. Yeah, obviously, Mikkel, a lot better fighter than Jeff. I knew that. And obviously, you know, he's undefeated in 39 fights. He was younger than me. I knew he's uh, all around a good fighter. And he never lost. So he didn't know how to lose until I fought him. But, you know, when you got two undefeated champions in the ring, uh, so, yeah, I, I have most respect for, for Mikkel. He gave me a, a very tough fight, and fourth round, he hit me with some right uppercuts, and uh, I forgot what day of the week it was, and going back in the corner, and a couple of slaps from my dad, saying, what's, come on, uh, what are you doing? So, yeah, I started being aggressive at the start of that fight, which played into his hands, but then I adapted, and that was one of my strengths, so I could just completely adapt in a fight and change my style. But basically, I started boxing, and that's when I pulled away with the fight, I think. It's quite comfortable after the fifth or sixth round, you know. That one of the tough, on. Was that one of the toughest fights? It was one of the toughest, and he's definitely top couple of best fighters ever fought. At that stage, he was, he was, yeah, he was dangerous, and he was a very, very good boxer, very complete, you know, but obviously, when they started the boxing from the outside, I started beating to the jab and so on, so I pulled away. That was way back in 2007, and he's still fighting now. Do you think you boxed the best, Mikel Kessler? Uh, oh, yeah, definitely. Without doubt, yeah, I think Mikel, uh, when I boxed him. And I know he's been very inactive, semi-retired, I know he had injury problems, um, but obviously, he's, listen, I'm taking nothing away, he's still... He's still a good fighter. He's still a good fighter. Yeah, top drawer, isn't he? Good fighter. Yeah. What about the the Millennium Stadium? I mean, you you know, you you work your way through, and the quiet days, and the sort of little leisure centres, and suddenly you're in, you know, you're the biggest stadium of all with with a huge, huge crowd. That must have been a very proud feeling walking out for that. It's amazing, you know, to where I come from, and I think 12 months before, I was in the ice rink. Hmm. I didn't even fill out the ice rink. And uh, to all, to all of a sudden, to be in a, in a matter of two years, to be f no, at 3 o'clock in the morning as well, mm. to have 50,000 people at the Millennium, just mind-blowing. Uh, uh, Incredible. Uh, at what point Incredible on your feeling. own doorstep did things start to change? Did the public perception start to change towards you? I think the Jeff Lacey was a massive turning point for me, 100%. This is the Lacey fight. That just put me on a different level. It's not, without just not being one of the champions, it was being the champion. Was there any beef there between you and Steve? No, I got no beef. 
I just, you think he has? I know. I just was laughing. I was going with Chris. I went, Chris, make sure you ask him why he pulled out. He went, yes, John. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>
what your drive was, you knew what your success was because you had the desire, you had that will, that self-belief and confidence. What do you think that, that same mistake all your opponents made when they got in the ring with you? Mistake is all the same. Step in the ring, that's a mistake they made. <laughs> I think what's, what was difficult is it's hard for them to, to find somebody to train for me because my style is, is different. I think my style is quite unique because you watch different tapes and I fight different ways. You know, I'm awkward, southpaw. And um, the way I used to throw punches, from angles I used to throw punches, mm -hmm. it was difficult to prepare for me. Close family, Joe, and one person that doesn't get a lot of mention is your mum, who, uh, who's a lovely lady, and I know didn't ever really want you to step into a ring, but you did, 46 times as a pro, all the way through the hours. How did she cope? Yeah, she didn't watch, never watched any of my fights. I would say, come on, Joe, when are you going to give up? This is from when I was about 10. Come on, Joe, do something else. And, no, I'll be okay, mum, I'm going to do okay. She never watched any of my fights, I'm at the pro, but she obviously watched the fight when she got the phone call, that everything's okay, then she'd watch it afterwards, you know. So I think she was one of the most relieved people when I, when I quit boxing. She was very happy, finally, you know. Saying, Mum, this time I'm, I'm going to quit. So. Did you ever have any outside influences whispering in the air saying, listen, you get away from your dad, son, I've, I know this training is really course. good. Of course, yeah, definitely, yeah. Listen, I think when I went through that period of um, David Starry and so on, a lot of people were saying, and actually I was thinking to myself, you know, they said, when you change trainer, I said, Dad, I, and I actually told my dad, I said, Dad, I think I'm going to get another trainer. So my dad involved, but another, another trainer as well. And you know what? I was talking about it and everything else. I you know what? So bad, I went like, if it wasn't for my dad, I would never be boxing in the first place. You know, he's the one that took me to the gym. You know, never had no funding. You know, ABA champion, best in the country. I had no funding. You know, I was signed on. You know, I had no money. He'd have to give me 20 quid here, 20 quid there. And that's the way it was until I turned pro. And yeah, he's, he trained me from the age of 10. And uh, I thought, nah, I'm, I'm not going to do that. So I listened, I said, you know, I was sort of trying to blame other things. And, but I was injured all the time. And you're trying to think what could improve. You I was frustrated. And, you know, it's amazing. It's, it's, I'm, I'm so lucky that my dad's been able to sort of share what I went through, go through these fights, and you know, beautiful memories. Is that the thing you miss the most, that camaraderie in the gym? You know, the, the guy, you're not, not going out to fight, just meeting all your mates at the gym and just doing all the same thing? Yeah, I suppose, so that's all, yeah, as well, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's good, good times, you know, hard work, hard work, but good times. You knew after Roy Jones that that was it? There was never a chance of, of going back, obviously, you've been retired for a while now, you've got that unbeaten record, but the temptation, the carrots, <laughs> the dangling, the Carl Frotches, etc. never a... A moment where you thought, come on, I'll do it again. No, because, listen, like I said, to finish my own trip, I made my last fight. And I always wanted to fight Madison Square Garden. And, you know, it was so emotional because I remember going into the garden and looking, I'm like close to tears like before, and I thought, this is it, Joe. And I, and I started to reflect where I came from. The little council state in South Wales, and I'm in Madison Square Garden, man. Do you know what I mean? And to me, it was, you know, whew, it was unbelievable. You know, fighting a legend, and just thousands of people coming to see me from, from Britain, paying their money to come and see me, which was fantastic. And you know what? I could have, I could have stopped Roy. And people said to me, why well, are you showing up, dropping you out? No, I was, I was, if you see, I was enjoying myself because I knew it was my last fight. And I remember counting down the rounds. I remember, come on, Joe, four rounds to go. Let's enjoy it. I remember saying to myself, Joe, this is the last round of your life. And the what I went through, you know, it's just, I remember it, it's beautiful, you know, and, uh, that was that, you know what I mean? I was happy to do the 12 rounds and just beautiful. I don't explain it. When we did the gloves were off and you were sat around the table, Chris Eubank, Steve Collins, Richard Woodall, yourself were sat around there and you, you seemed very content. content. When you're all talking about who's the best, who's not the best, and you thought, well, I'm going to the pro. I beat that one, that one, on that one, didn't I? <laughs> yeah. I beat him on the fight, you make the excuses. Okay. <laughs> just, just, I just sit just, back and let them all argue against each other. Just tell me, was it, was it now, now that's done, was there any beef there between you and Steve? For that no, I've got no it? beef. I just, you think he has? I, don't, I just was laughing, I was going with Chris. I went, Chris, make sure you ask him why he pulled out. He went, yes, John. <laughs> I was waiting for him to ask him. I just sat back and oh, okay. Yeah, it was so a tell me, a... why didn't you want to fight Joe? And you can see, like, Steve was getting a bit. What are you trying to say? <laughs> Did you I've believe won. Steve's excuses? I don't know. He made two excuses. First, he said he, was, he said he was injured, then he said he couldn't find the motivation. But for whatever reason, I, listen, it's water under the bridge. And... Steve Starr would have suited you, wouldn't it, though? You'd have loved Oh, yeah, definitely. 100% confident. Yeah. 
in uh, beating Steve Collins, but you know what? I'm not going to say that. Listen, Steve had a great career, and uh, I respect him, and um, it's, it, I respect his decision. And do, am I sad he didn't fight me? No, because I fought Chris Eubank, and, and I had a terrifically hard fight with him, and it taught me so much in that 12 rounds to put me in good stead for the rest of my career. You know? Do you think people will remember you as one of the greatest British fighters since the war? I hope so. I hope so. I think, you know, I think basically I've, uh, what I've achieved, I think, in time, people will realise, you know, I think it's, it's not going to be easy to, for somebody else to be a world champion for that, that length of time. I fought the best and always wanted to fight the best, you know? Any messages to, to youngsters starting out today, kids that are getting into the gyms and think they want to they wanna get to, to where Joe Calzaghe got to and, and, and get 46 and 0 or something like that. They, they've got their dreams. What, what advice would you give the youngsters who are getting into the boxing now? Always believe in yourself. Always train hard. Dedicate yourself to the sport. See your sport. And believe in yourself. You know, because I got knocked down so many times, people tell me I'm never going to do it from being in school from being bullied at school, from a bad time at school. And you know what, I believed in myself and had faith I was going to become a champion. If I, if I listened to other people, I would never be a champion of who I am today. So I was believing in myself. You have two sons. Do they box? No. <laughs> would you want them to box? <laughs> well, lovers, not fighters. Um, <laughs> <laughs> would I want them to box? No. Do you know what, boxing, listen, they, they, they box train, you know. Um, they, they pretty handy, it's good, tells you, teach, teach you discipline. Boxing is a fantastic sport discipline, they look after yourself. Joe had one fight, he'd done pretty well. He came up with a black eye, he unboxed it again since that was two years ago. He thought it was pretty hard to sport, you know. But um, yeah, they work out, you know, they, they're pretty good in, in work on the pads with them and everything else, but no, nah, they don't want to sort of, uh, they don't get their pretty faces hit, no. Nah. <laughs> <laughs> Left that with the dad, it's okay. How would you like to be remembered? Looking back on your career, you know, you. Oh, look, or oh, you as a man? Um, just, you know, just, just a great fighter. Everybody wants to be a great fighter, don't they? And uh, at the end of the day, I always wanted to entertain as well, you know. Never, never shied away from a fight. And even when I got hurt, I always come back for more. Even when I got dropped, I always come straight back at the opponent. I always fought with my heart on my sleeve, you know, and I always wanted to entertain people are paying to come and see me you know so uh is that summer up or yeah one well I, i've got to thank you i've got to thank you for pulling out for a lot of, of a lot of fights because you made me a lot of money man i know <laughs> <laughs> i'm still with my 10 percent we dealed on i said i'm gonna fall out full next week and he's always on standby so i pull out and i said no another <laughs> johnny <laughs> nelson wbo defense i know yeah, we live it was through great. it I know. Oh, joe calzaghi thank you very much it's been oh, a pleasure, pleasure. Thank you. It's a first round win on his debut for Joe Kawasaki. I'm ready to take on anyone. Oh, the left hand puts you back on the floor for only the fifth time in his career. What a start by Kawasaki. But Kawasaki has answered the questions here. All of them in the affirmative. Good fighter. You've done good. Joe Calzaghe, world champion. How does that sound? Sounds brilliant, you know, what the hard work I've done. I just thank God. If you shout off and you can't do what you say you're going to do, then shut up. I told everybody what I was going to do against Chris Eubank, and I did the business. Like you said, the day I don't do the business, I will shut up. Joe Calzaghe in sizzling style. How impressive was that? People think you're mouthy. You're not really like that, are you, Joe? I'm not mouthy at all. I'm quite shy, actually. You know? I punched like a cruiserweight, but I got the speed of a flyweight. One other thing. I got was... a head like this. <laughs> 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 you said that. Superman. He's <laughs> <laughs> coming, guys. He's coming.
<laughs> he's still in, man. Yeah. Still in. He's coming back all right. Still in. <laughs> <laughs> nice one, Joe. Nice one. Watch all six Sky Sports channels on your mobile and online. You're watching Sky Sports.